Well, hello again. Here we still are in the middle of this uh, coronavirus quarantine. Uh, we have that, and then now we're hearing reports of earthquakes all over the world, locust swarms that are engulfing continents, uh, and the latest thing is two-inch hornets that are destroying our beehives. In the midst of all this, we have people who are calling themselves Christians, who are picking and choosing uh, parts of the Bible that they want to believe. In some cases, they're going to extremes and saying that uh, this is all God's judgment, which it may be, but I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that. Uh, and others who uh, apparently don't seem to believe that uh, God's judgment is coming. And I'm not going to go that way either. Some of us remember, oh, back uh, quite a while ago, the Jesus movement of the 70s. Some of us were there. There was a simple message. Uh, God loves us, and he wants to gather people uh, out of the world, out of all humanity, uh, to be a part of the kingdom that he is going to establish. Some have seems to have forgotten that message and seem to think that uh, uh, through our own efforts we're going to establish that kingdom of God. And yet the Bible is clear that that is not the case, that God is going to put an end to all of the kingdoms of man and uh, create his own kingdom upon the earth. As Bob Dylan said, he has plans of his own to set up his throne when he returns. In Acts, uh, first chapter, sixth verse, it says, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They still had that on their minds. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. He didn't say it wasn't going to happen. He said it's... Uh, we have something else to do first. He says, you uh, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the world. You shall be my witnesses. Witnesses to what? Well, We'll go on here a bit in Acts. He says, After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing, we can assume they were angels, stood beside them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So that would have been the first thing that they were uh, to be witnesses to. Well, actually the second thing, because the first thing they were to be witnesses to was his resurrection. In writing to the Thessalonians, Paul tells them this. He says he doesn't want them to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always 
be with the Lord. This seems like something else that the disciples were to be witnesses to. The fact that the Lord had gone into heaven and that he would return from heaven. And not only that, but he was going to change us into his image and likeness. Interesting that I had a theology professor that going over this scripture said, well, we really don't know what Paul was talking about. You know, if we don't know what Paul was talking about here, how can we know anything? It seems really quite clear. It is really what the whole book of First Thessalonians is about. Looking in chapter 1 of First Thessalonians, uh, Paul commends the, the Thessalonians, first of all, for their faith. He says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in which with in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And what was their faith in? He says, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. So they weren't, they were true witnesses. They were out telling everybody they met. Oh, what had happened to them, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. That would be great, that the word of God would go forth uh, so well, so articulately, that uh, we wouldn't have to say anything. He says, for they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols. That was number one. Turn to God from idols and serve a living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, to wait expectantly for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. So Paul commended them for two things, for turning aside from their idolatry and to wait for their waiting expectantly for the Lord to return. Uh, and their expectation was that he would rescue them from the wrath that's coming. We don't talk about wrath very much, but there is wrath that is coming upon the world that has rejected the salvation that is offered. Once again, there are those who want to go out on a limb and predict when that this wrath is coming. I'm not going to do that. When we get to second, uh, the second chapter, he says uh, regarding the Thessalonians, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you? in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming. Paul is saying that when the Lord returns, that he is uh, going to receive a reward based upon uh, their uh, uh, receiving of his message. And he says, for you are our glory and joy, the Thessalonians themselves. We get to chapter 3, and I'm just going through these to show that that's what this whole book is about, is about the return of Christ, which is a doctrine that some in the church seem to think is embarrassing. Chapter 3, verse 12, it says, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. See, so it's not just in chapter 4. It's in all of the uh, chapters. Uh, and we get to 4, and it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who have died. They are going to participate uh, just like the rest of us, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede or go before or possibly interfere with those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In chapter 5, he says, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, we have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Nobody knows when this is going to happen. Jesus said of that day and hour, knows no man, not the angels, uh, not himself at that time, uh, only the Father. The Father has set aside this time uh, to act in the future. And he told a story. He said that there, he predicted that there will be some who forget about this important teaching. Uh, he said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward? This is in Luke 12. Who is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Now, what, what is, who is he talking about here? His servant who's put in charge of other servants to give them their rations. I believe he's talking about ministers, people whose job it is to give to God's people their rations, their ration of the word of God at the proper time. He says, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. The one who takes this seriously will receive a reward. But he says if that slave, that minister, says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming. Or maybe we don't even believe that he's coming at all. And he begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. That the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Because if we don't believe this doctrine, that, the Christ, that Christ is returning to establish his kingdom, then we truly are unbelievers. So back to 1 Thessalonians, Paul says in 5.4, he says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. You know, we have uh, all the information we need right here in the scripture. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. For since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. We talk about being saved. You know, I got saved in uh, somewhere around 19... 
71 or 72. Uh, but we still have a hope, a future hope of our uh, salvation being completed. That we are going to uh, be changed into his image and that we will be uh, participants in the kingdom that he is bringing upon the earth. Paul goes on and says, For God has not destined us for wrath. Once again, that term wrath. But for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Whether we die before he comes or if we are still living when he comes, we will be participants in the kingdom that he is establishing. He says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. We should be continually encouraged, encouraging and building one another up in this promise that we are not as, uh, we're not going to live forever as we are in our corruptible bodies, but we are going to be changed into his likeness. We're going to be creatures uh, that are going to be like him. C.S. Lewis put it this way, God intends to make us into creatures that are like him in order that we can have fellowship and friendship uh, on the same level that he is at. Uh, that will be a glorious day. And now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we also do for you so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints.